Okay, good to go. Okay, good evening. Um, we're very excited uh, to have this opportunity to hear from our Venezuelan comrades to learn from and discuss this important project of the Anti-Blockade Observatory in Venezuela, the geopolitical map on sanctions. My name is Suzanne Adeli, and I am a member of the steering committee of the International People's Tribunal on U.S. Imperialism. Since January of 2023, the People's Tribunal has held 16 hearings on the use of economic coercive measures on countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, Asia, and Africa, imposed unilaterally, unilaterally by the United States, as well as by the European Union and the United Nations. You can view some of these remarkable hearings on our website, sanctionstribunal.org. We see economic coercive measures as inherently violent, designed to maintain economic inequality continue the theft of wealth from the global south and preserve racial hierarchy in the international system. They constitute and are constituted by structures of imperialism designed to maintain the neo-colonial capitalist order through, the global, so through global south wealth transfer, income deflation, underdevelopment, and the massive empower empowerment of Western monopolies. They are means of disciplining and controlling Global South sovereignty and blocking the emergence of a multipolar world order. The tribunal is a collective international effort to build systems of accountability rooted in global cross-movement solidarity, both within and outside of the law, to challenge the violence of imperialism through sanctions. We have worked to interrogate sanctions, not from the perspective of those who enforce them, but from the perspective of those most impacted. Through these hearings, we have also learned how these measures not only impact the nations that are directly targeted, but also those nations who rely on economic trade and political solidarity from the targeted nations. We've also learned about the various ways that these nations have continued to resist. In analyzing sanctions, blockades, and other economic coercive measures, it is important to understand where, how, and by whom they are utilized. Thus, an analysis of the political economy of sanctions and the structural, spatial, temporal, and racial configuration of the actors that deploy these measures is necessary. We believe that this map developed by the Anti-Blockade Observatory in Caracas is a vital contribution to this effort. Now I'm going to hand the mic over to my colleague, Karina. Thank you so much for this uh, uh, powerful introduction, Suzanne. My name is Karina Mullen, and I am also on the steering committee of the International People's Tribunal on US imperialism, sanctions, blockades, and economic coercive measures. Um, I will be introducing the amazing speakers we have today. Um, and I'll start by introducing everyone, and then we will go into the individual talks, but this will, I think, help um, with the uh, fluidity of the event. So um, uh, we have first, uh, our first speaker will be Carlos Ron, uh, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs for North America, and uh, President of the Simon Bolivar Institute for Peace and Solidarity Among Peoples, extremely um, honored um, and excited to have you here with us today. And also um, honored and excited to have Vice Minister William Castillo, um, uh, Vice Minister of Anti-Blockade Policies and head of the Anti-Blockade Observatory in Caracas. Um, we had the opportunity um, to meet with both Carlos and William in the context of a fact-finding mission to Venezuela this past July. Um, whose mission was to investigate the impact of unilateral and multilateral economic course of measures on the people, economy, and the state of Venezuela. The mission was carried out in cooperation with the um, U.S. National Lawyers Guild 
and the International Association of Democratic Lawyers. We also um, had participation from many of the tribunal's co-organizers, including um, Black Alliance for Peace, and we have uh, Margaret Kimberly, who's here with us today, um, who was on that mission with us, as well as uh, many comrades from um, around the, the globe, really, from Philippines, Kenya, and Lebanon. The mission culminated in our hearing on Venezuela in, on July 28th, a particularly auspicious day as it was the birthday of Comandante Hugo Chavez. During our visit to the anti-blockade observatory, the delegation had the opportunity to get a sneak peek of uh, the map that we're going to be learning about today and um, to learn about all the work that went into its development. Our group um, comprised of anti-imperialist lawyers, journalists, and academics understood immediately the importance of this digital tool as a way to help visualize the extent and devastation wrought by this regime of unilateral coercive measures um, designed as Venezuela's ambassador to the UN, Samuel Moncada, um, said at the MAPS launch at the UN yesterday, um, for the control of weak nations by nations that have a dominant position in the world economic system. Most importantly, of course, the U.S. Um, issuing, as the map tells us, and I've got, had the uh, pleasure to go through the map um, uh, uh, before the event, um, that the U.S., of course, issues 34% of the world's unilateral coercive uh, measures, as, um, as is demonstrated by this map. The ambassador went on to correctly and powerfully describe UCMs as weapons of mass destruction. So we are um, excited to learn more about this important tool and how it can help us uh, to advance our work as lawyers, as educators, um, and political organizers uh, here in the belly of the beast, um, and of course across the world, as we resist and seek to hold accountable the US and its allies for their crimes, crimes against humanity, and of course the, the plunder of the wealth and peoples of the world as we build towards this international zone of free of sanctions. Uh, on this point, I am also incredibly excited and honored to introduce our other two speakers who will be responding um, to Carlos and William's presentations um, and um, I'm, uh, have, who have themselves done a tremendous amount uh, in their respective areas of work to advance this struggle against sanctions and blockades and by extension, US imperialism. They will provide their feedback on the map as well as discuss ways it will be useful in their own organizing work. We have uh, Dr. Rosemary Mealy, who um, it will be joining us, who is a member of the board of directors of the Interreligious Foundation for Community Organization, IFCO, um, and Pastors for Peace, and the New York uh, Cuba Sea Coalition. She is also the author of Fidel and Malcolm X, uh, Memories of a Meeting. We also have Juyan Park, who is a member of uh, Notatol and the engagement editor at The Real News. So we'll begin now um, with Carlos Ron. Thank you so much, Carlos, for joining us. Thank you, Corina. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you uh, for this uh, opportunity. Thank you for being here. Uh, for us, it's uh, a very um, important part of our annual visit to the United Nations to be able to talk to the people of the United States. Um, we always like to reassure everyone that whatever our relationship may be with the government of the United States, and despite all the uh, difficulties that we've had over the last years, our relationship with the people of the United States is always one of, of fraternity, of, you know, of uh, solidarity, which has been very important. Uh, for us, um, not only to receive the solidarity from, from you, but also so that uh, you know that we are also aware of your struggles and, and, your, uh, and, and, and we are also in solidarity with you, with you as well. Um, as you know, Venezuela has been under sanctions uh, and under an aggression uh, by the United States uh, since since the beginning of the Bolivarian Revolution itself. I mean, there were already different types of actions uh, that were done since President Chavez came to office in, in uh, 1999 that slowly built up uh, to the 
sanctions regime that, that we have uh, today, particularly during the uh, Obama administration, during the last years of the Obama administration, uh, there was a couple of uh, um, laws that were approved in Congress, which paved the way for an executive order uh, to be um, applied by President Obama, where it called Venezuela an unusual and extraordinary threat uh, to the national security and the foreign policy of the United States. This, of course, um, were not a threat in the sense uh, of, of that you would read that uh, document. Uh, everybody can obviously uh, understand that. But it was the way that they, they, that they could justify the imposition of these uh, measures against Venezuela in order to coerce the, the government to change its policies, to change its perspectives, or even, if that wasn't possible, to make someone make those decisions within Venezuela, where it be members of government to betray uh, the Constitution or members of the armed forces, which is even more serious, to betray the Constitution. This is not something that we, uh, you know, that, that you can just imply from. This is something that actually was stated by many of the U.S. officials at the time. You have there are many instances in which, uh, for example, uh, Elliot Abrams would say, you know, we're waiting for the military to take the right decision, and, and John Bolton would say something uh, the same uh, um, position. So these were measures that have that that were taken uh, uh, after the the executive order. For it first started by uh, placing people on on different types of lists. Uh, these were personal uh, um, measures, but they also have implications because if I'm, for example, the uh, sitting president of the central bank, and there's one of these measures against me, then nobody can uh, from outside feel safe about signing a simple contract because there's implications. Uh, the system of, of sanctions have uh, over, an overcompliance attached to it. That is, That means that it's not only what the sanction literally says, but what people may not want to do or actions people may not want to take because of how they could later be affected by some sort of uh, reprimand from, from the United States government. Under, under this logic by now, Venezuela has already been hit with 930 uh, measures. Um, and again, these are measures that when you add them up and when you, when you realize uh, how, you know, the, their impact, it has made everything harder for the Venezuelan people. They're, the purpose of the, uh, of the measures themselves and this is something admitted by those who designed the, the, the sanctions, is to inflict pain, because that is what would bring about those changes. Uh, there's a Richard Nephew we often cite, who's uh, today is the uh, anti-corruption czar. He, but he might, I hope he's working on the Menendez case today. <laughs> I, had to, I had to say that. <laughs> um, but... Uh, so the anti-corruption czar at the moment, uh, but before that he was the uh, the one who designed the policy, uh, the sanctions policy against Iran and against other countries. And basically, he there's a book of his that says you know uh, the art of sanctions, and it says that the the motive, the reason you do this is to inflict pain. So what we're trying to do uh, in Venezuela, of course, um, we have resisted this as a people. We have, and there's many stories, and some of you have been recently to Venezuela. You know that the Venezuelan people uh, have not taken this, uh, these measures and these attacks lightly. Yes, they have hurt our economy, seriously. We have lost about 99% of an income if you compare what we used to earn in 2015 to what we earned in 2020. Uh, and that's, that's not an exaggeration. That's, that's a, a, a real number. We have had many losses. In, in material losses, we have lost material. Uh, we have lost also uh, lives uh, under this uh, process. Um, but the Venezuelan people have not taken this sitting down. The Venezuelan people have tried to, you know, put all their efforts to continuing, you know, the the project that we engaged in. Continuing, the the government has been uh, President Maduro has been engaged in 
making sure that you know we can provide the basic necessities for the people in the middle of this aggression and that we can build that society that we're that we've been looking uh towards now part of the uh part of that resistance or part of that effort is to also think how we can take this to another level uh multilateral level where we can and how we can work together with other countries that are under the same uh aggression uh like you mentioned before you know it's about 30% of the world 30% of the world is somehow under one of these uh types of measures so the idea is how do we how do we uh come together with proposals that can help eliminate this as a real policy option see we need to make people understand especially here uh decision makers in in the United States that sanctions are not a policy that you can implement because under the belief that this is somehow more humane than fighting a a war or promoting an invasion or because that's sort of how it's sold well sanctions are better than you know take military action or you know it's not it has it has terrible effects you know they all they all had a very um uh, uh, similar effects to to a conventional war even even sometimes worse because in the in the, in the conventional war you sort of see you know where you're going to get attacked uh, you you have a a rapid response sanctions can deteriorate uh your infrastructure your uh, uh possibilities of acquiring food and uh, medicine in such ways that you have no response left so um in this project which my comrade William will speak t- to you about is one of those attempts from Venezuela but together with other countries we want other countries to engage this because this is a way that we can show the world how the real how 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 we can actually see the effect that these sanctions are are having and we can see their numbers their dimensions and and how they cover such an important part of the world in um during the event uh yesterday and this all all close um during the event yesterday um i think it was the representative from russia that said something that, that I thought was very very important and very interesting because he mentioned that at one point uh in time the, there was a use there was a widely accepted use of chemical weapons and then people started protesting and saying this is something there's something really wrong about this use of chemical weapons because of the effect and the of course all everything that we know about them and eventually it came to the point that it's you know there's all these rules now and conventions and everything people trying to get rid of the chemical weapons as a means of war what in a way what we're trying to do with with this uh type of tools and with with these uh denunciations that we do uh every time we we go outside of Venezuela is to raise consciousness and awareness and so that we can finally end the idea of using sanctions as a means of anything you know diplomacy uh the co- dialogue those are the ways countries should relate to each other even when there are differences not subjecting people whole populations whole countries to to an aggression that that constitutes a crime against humanity so this is part of our effort thank you Buenas tardes. Ya están listas las las traductoras, es decir. No, buenas tardes, un gran placer, un saludo. Good evening. Greetings. It is a great pleasure to be here. And this is a people's forum and to be able to share part of the work that Venezuela has done in order to face from the knowledge perspective this unheard of aggression. It is an unprecedented aggression in the history of Venezuela and of many countries such as in Cuba, Nicaragua. This has never been seen the way that we have been attacked by imperialism, by corporations, by the financial system all around the world and by the political allies of the US. So I am going to present this uh, report to you. They, we did it yesterday in the UN, and I'm going to be a little less diplomatic here than I was in the United Nations. And I am going to 
mention some other things that are behind this narrative. Well, the first question, you can look at the screen. Well, the important thing is that you look at the map, not me. So why a geopolitical map of sanctions? It's because this is a global policy that affects many people, many countries, and it affects the life of those people. Geopolic geopolitics is about the analysis of politics through geography and particularly resources, the land, uh, the territory, economic resources of the different countries. So we cannot understand sanctions if we do not understand the struggle and the fight for resources, for the control of the economic resources. That is why this is a geopolitical map. And why is this necessary? I have four basic reasons. First of all, because we don't have any map of this type. So we needed to do it because it doesn't exist. In no part of the world we could find a database that gathers all of the aggressions that have been committed for decades against countries, and they are disguised as humanitarian measures, demo democratic measures, or punishments for the violations of human rights. That rhetoric hides an aggression that is uh, that targets the peoples and their way of life. The material means for the livelihood of many peoples around the world. And the second reason is because today we have 30 countries around the world that have uh, around 28% of the population of the world. And they comprise 78% of the territory of the planet. Of course, this includes China and Russia. Only these two countries are enough. And this is a problem that involves the world. So we need to address this from a global perspective. The third reason is that it can happen to any country in the world because uh, there is no small country or a developing country, they are not able to develop sovereign policies because they are going to be subject to sanctions, to coercive measures, if uh, the great superpowers decide that those policies do not align to what they want, or if the superpowers lose the control of resources. So that decision makes them attack mercilessly. So, and the last element is because they, these are uh, measures in it that are criminal and illegal. They violate the UN Charter, which establishes the sovereign equality of the peoples, and it also reaches the Rome Statute because these are crimes against the civilian populations of the countries. So there are enough reasons to be able to analyze this problem from this perspective. We're going to go to some points that I know you understand very well so we can be able to navigate this map that has been developed by Venezuela. This is the second session of this presentation that we have done outside Venezuela, so you are privileged to see this. So the first find is that after the Second World War, sanctions became a policy, a foreign policy tool. They are an essential part of the foreign policy of the U.S. and other economic superpowers. And they are applied against states, they are applied against people, they are uh, applied against organizations, public companies, or even private companies, or even against the assets and the resources of the sanctioned countries. So this is an element that is justified, as Carlos already said, trying to compare it to war, 
They want to say that it is preferable to sanction a country than to invade that country. So they replace the idea of a war with the warmongering policy, an indirect warmongering policy. And this is incredibly important and also dangerous for humanity because at the end it means that the elements of war have not been abandoned. They, they're still being used. To confirm this, we can look at this chart. It is in a private database of a U.S. university, and we see the growth of sanctions starting in 1950. And the most important thing here is to see the curve, how it accelerates. Every year, it has become a more and more used instrument. And we also have multilateral sanctions that have been imposed by the United Nations. In any case, there are different methodologies, and what we want to highlight here is the trend. We are not in a world, we are in a world in which, which sanctions have become the pillar of the foreign policy of the U.S., an aggressive policy. And I said this yesterday in the U.N., in the world, not even in the United States, that is not a, a definition, a clear definition of sanctions. The multilateral world does not agree upon the definition of this policy, to create a concept of this policy. And this lack that has been detected by rapporteur Alena Duhan, she is the most important official of the United Nations that works on this topic. She is calling upon the states to collectively build the methodology, the doctrines, and the definitions so that we can study this problem at a world scale. As a summary of this first part, so we have this policy that is that a warmongering policy. It is a unilateral aggression, illegal and criminal aggression, as I said before. It is also cruel and inhuman because it, it is aimed at producing the pain of the sanctioned countries. And it produces pain by affecting the economy, by affecting the material means of the livelihood of the peoples. So these policies are designed custom-made. So each program of sanctions is applied depending on the characteristics of each country. The program of sanctions of Venezuela is not the same as the one for Iran, even though we are both oil countries. But they study the economy on the other countries and they impose the measures depending on the particular characteristics of that economy. And here we also see in more concrete terms and more interesting for you, this chart was made with data of the Treasury Department of the U.S. These are official data. And we see how the past four administrations of the U.S. have been applying the sanctions. So we have the Bush administration, which applied an average of 500 sanctions in the eight years it was in government. Then Obama had between 500 and 600 measures every year. Donald Trump increased it much more. In four years, he imposed about 1,000 sanctions against uh, several countries in the world. And of course, we have the Biden administration. Evidently, we look at the last bar. It is, of course, related to the Russia-Ukraine conflict in which the sanctions multiplied. Yesterday, the Russia representative said that the data that we have are not uh, accurate because we have uh, this figure, but uh, they have about 8,000 more sanctions because every week, every month, they continue to impose sanctions against the Russian economy. This would deserve a comment, a separate comment, because what is happening with the sanctions against Russia had not happened before because they are being reverted against the sanctioned countries. And this is a very important geopolitical element because it is different taking the oil from Venezuela, which of course is going to affect some markets and some part of the economy. 
even though Venezuela has an important volume, we are not uh, the biggest player in the oil market. But if we sanction Russia, it means blocking the gas for the European population, for many, many countries in Europe. So this is another phenomenon that starts at a curse because of the sanctions against Russia. But what I wanted to highlight here is that unstoppable trend, apparently without any control regarding the use of sanctions by the U.S. And here I briefly said uh, comments on what Carlos said. In our analysis, we see that sanctions may have effects that are worse than the effects of war. Here we compare. We compare those five curves. We have the red one corresponds to Venezuela. And we compare this with the fall of the GDP of those economies in certain conflicts, certain junctures. So we are comparing this with the fall in the GDP in the U.S. after the Wall Street crash in 1929. This is also compared with the GDP fall of Germany after the Second World War, then in France before the war that had an economic crisis, and also the Bosnia-Herzegovina war. So there are different conflicts, and we see the decrease of the GDP. Look at the one from Venezuela in the red curve, how it falls, starting from the first year that we measure it, without a war, without being bombarded. But it has dropped much more than in several countries that have some wars in different at different points of our history. So this reveals the warmongering nature of this. Because it is even worse. Because at a war we still have the humanitarian right. There are some humanitarian corridors to provide food, to provide medicine for the evacuation of the population. But when there is a sanction war, there are no corridors. There is no way for people to be saved because they are invisible. When Venezuela cannot purchase food or acquire medicines, even during the pandemic, there are no humanitarian corridors for the solution of this problem. People die indiscriminately, and this is what happens in our country. So we are showing this chart as an example that the scientific evidence demonstrates that sanctions can be even worse than a war. This is a global problem, a problem of the world, and this is how we address it. We are going to look at some of the characteristics of that problem. We are going to navigate this map in a few minutes. This is the map. This includes all the 30 countries with UCMs. And the idea of this instrument that we have developed is to create a digital tool free access that can be also fed with the official figures of each country so that we can do some comparisons. Because as Alina Duan said, there is not a database, there are no definitions, there is no methodology. And in this case, sanctions will be invisible. And they justify this by saying, well, we're going to sanction the president of Zimbabwe. And of course, the news is that the president is sanctioned because he is a corrupt. But the president of Zimbabwe, as the president of Venezuela, has an economic role to play in the country. And then the trade exchange of the countries is deteriorated. When a president or a finance minister is sanctioned, it seemingly they are sanctioning this person, but actually they are creating a financial crisis because those officials cannot travel around the world, cannot sign any agreements, they cannot renegotiate the debt, as it happens in Venezuela. So the media say, well, these officers are being sanctioned. This is not going to affect the civilian population. But when the country cannot be included in the financial market, the effects are immediate on the population. And this is what has happened in several countries of Africa, Asia, and of course the three cases of our continent, which are Cuba, you know it very well, Nicaragua, 
and Venezuela. These are the three countries that have has been appointed as an unusual and extraordinary threat to the safety of the U.S. And you wonder, well, how is Cuba a threat? Some people may say, well, in the 60s, they had a base and they were related to the Soviet Union. But what is Cuba today? Cuba is an independent and a sovereign country. They produce science, technology, but they cannot uh, have free trade in the world. And other people might say, well, Venezuela can thread the U.S. because they, they have oil. But the real, in reality, Venezuela was a safe provider of oil for the U.S. Many streets of your country, in this city, and many cities, and the highways, these structures were built with Venezuelan oil. Venezuela was the first energy provider during the Second World War. Well, I cannot say this in the United Nations because, you know, we need to respect the diplomacy, but we, need, we, didn't, we don't need to do that here. So, um, German submarines went to Venezuela to destroy Venezuelan's refineries. People can now visit uh, Venezuelan waters and Aruba waters, and they see the submarine, German submarine, because Venezuela was the basis to provide uh, these uh, uh, resources to the world. Countries without uh, conflict, without any measure against Venezuela, and our Russian um, friends suggested that uh, Russia and China, contrary to Venezuela, they have uh, countermeasures, meaning that when they take uh, measures against them, they can have countermeasures because those are powerful economies. So they have the capacity to, to, to carry out countermeasures. On the contrary, Venezuela, Cuba, or Nicaragua, they cannot take countermeasures because they are very weak countries. So um, they are sanctioning mainly small economies such as Venezuela's. And here we have a little bit the balance today in the world. Eight countries and a group of uh, countries such as the European Union, uh, encompassing uh, uh, various countries, uh, uh, well, they sanction uh, these countries in various continents. Well, we need to include Eritrea because the Eritrea representative yesterday said uh, he was complaining because we didn't include uh, we didn't include Eritrea. And what he this guy said, which is interesting, uh, is that uh, since there is a conflict in that area, that's another excuse. Since they have military conflicts, there is a gr country supporting a group, and based on that, they sanction the economies of those countries. It's something incredible. So in Africa, they have we use this excuse. Well, you know, there are tribal wars. Therefore, a country is supporting this and that. So for them not to support that tribe, we're going to apply sanctions. But in the end, it's the population of those countries uh, who are hurting because of those sanctions. Now, what can you find here on this map? Well, in our Phase one, which is the initial phase, many data are missing there. We have many sanctions which are invisible. Carlos mentioned that, for instance, that the overcompliance issue is, is terrible, it's tragic. And I would like to take a minute just to elaborate on this and how this affected Venezuela. Venezuela has been excluded, for instance, from the, the SWIFT system. What does it mean? Well, we cannot make transfers because we do not receive the SWIFT code which validate the transaction. The SWIFT system, what does it does? When you want to transfer or receive money, the SWIFT system say, says, well, you can proceed with, trans with transfer because there is no crime, there are no criminals paying or receiving money. So the SWIFT is a way for the banking system to validate millions of transactions. 
Now, when you analyze the sanctions, you realize there is no sanction in, in indicating that Venezuela is excluded from the SWIFT. However, what happened in 2017, the FinCEN, a U.S. agency that should uh, survey the transactions in the finance system, they issued an international red warning, okay, like the Interpol red warning. And they said that banks should be careful and should check Venezuelan transactions because there was a suspicion, suspicion that they were, there was some um, terrorist financing and etc. And just that warning made it impossible for the other banks to work with Venezuela. That's what we call the overcompliance. The overcompliance. Meaning that the banks, they don't want to deal with Venezuela, simply. And they avoid Venezuela. They, don't want, they do not approve any transaction coming from Venezuela. So the transactions against Venezuela establishes uh, sanctions of uh, up to $1 million or personal um, sanctions um, of uh, even 10 years prison uh, for those uh, accepting transactions from Venezuela. So you know what the banks say? Okay, no way I can work, I want to work with Venezuela because the dangers are too big. So uh, that's why many internet uh, companies, they do not provide internet services to Venezuela. Many suppliers refuse to go to Venezuela because they fear that in, if there is any client, a customer is sanctioned and is part of the transactions, they might be uh, punished. So we have the interactive uh, map with reports, news, and we're including and we invite you to participate. There is a digital a library opened to receive contributions, articles, in reports, uh, analysis, uh, produced both by the state or independent bodies, researchers, universities, research centers, etc., as you have here in the US. Well, this is a technical matter. I'm going to go over this very quickly. Uh, what we say here that currently we have uh, uh, sources from sanction sanctioning uh, countries, um, some data from sanctioned uh, entities, and uh, research, academic research. The idea is to strengthen this network to update on a daily basis this map. So this map could uh, um, translate and reflect reality in, on a daily basis. Now, how can we navigate on this? Is it possible? Well, if we click here, let's do it. We open like a, 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 a card with information, like a record with information, and then we can see uh, a narrative, uh, uh, the history, the information about the sanctioned countries. We give some graphs so we can have uh, the countries sanctioned, how many sanctions have been slapped. We build the narrative of sanctions regarding that country, and you have the reference, the sources, so people can check the original sources of that information. This is a complex task, of course, because we have main, much data that is not available, and uh, so there are many things missing, and that's what we want. We want to build on this. Also, we want to evaluate the impact, which is the most difficult. How m many people have been affected? Uh, how, what's, how can we uh, assess the damage caused to the economy? Those are invisible topics. People, perhaps some researchers, some university have, res have researched this, but uh, that people ignore the actual effect of these, of these sanctions and how they hurt the economy and the peoples of those countries. No, no. 
We could go upwards. There you see the statistics. Here we have uh, countries with the most sanctions, nine countries. According to our records, we need to update this with Russia. We have 26 thousand active sanctions in the world against these 30 countries. But the initial nine countries, Russia, Iran, Venezuela, Belarus, Ukraine is a special case. It is there because those sanctions uh, were slapped before the coup d'etat. And uh, they have not withdrawn those sanctions against uh, um, uh, Ukraine and those, uh, uh, and those data are in the OFAC. Because sometimes they, they take sanctions, and even though the country changes uh, their conduct, the sanctions remain, just in case, you know, in the future things will change in the opposite uh, direction, the, the sanctions will remain forever. You can go down. Here we have a to total sanction ranking. We click here. And there we see the total sanctions. How many people in the world are affected? This is the total of the countries. How many entities? public uh, agencies or private companies. This is the very OFAC methodology. That's the first ranking. Ships, planes, aircraft sanctioned. So, sanctions, they target transportation. Because without transportation, there is no trade. So, Venezuela, we have 39 oil um, oil ships sanctioned and 30 foreign um, uh, vessels uh, from other countries are sanctioned as well. So, so there is not a physical blockade, but there is a threat that at any rate, uh, at any moment, those vessels could be halted and uh, stopped because of the sanctions. And that has just happened to Iran. They detain um, vessels, they are, and they can't uh, take uh, the, uh, uh, the charge, the load. For instance, uh, they assaulted some private uh, vessels with, with Iran oil, and that uh, oil was uh, sold in Texas by the U.S. administration. Even the, the piracy is a, is, a, is a piracy because they took the load of oil coming to Venezuela and they sold it in Texas. So this is a result of the sanctions, you see. And now we have a, a, an airplane, a cargo aircraft. It's been almost two years a Venezuelan aircraft bought by Venezuela, by Venezuela to Iran. Now the U.S., Based on the fact that this Iranian company is sanctioned, they pressured the Argentina's uh, authorities, and this uh, aircraft went to Argentina with the commercial cargo. Well, they were retained for months. The crew was retained. Finally, they were freed because there was nothing against them. But now the aircraft is still in Argentina. It's been there for a year and a half. And the maintenance of that aircraft is paid by the State Department of the United States. And that uh, aircraft is there. So people go there. They make the maintenance of the aircraft. And that is paid by the US while they decide, they, they expect, wait for the tribunal to rule about this aircraft. 
That Venezuelan aircraft was the aircraft that allowed Venezuela to transport vaccines to the Caribbean islands. It's a cargo aircraft that is being used to, to, to transport vaccines and uh, and we, we, we convey uh, assistance to the Caribbean nation when they suffer from hurricanes. Uh, it has evacuated people in the Caribbean, in other areas with tragedies. So that cargo aircraft has been used to help and assist Caribbean South American nations. So despite the blockade, Venezuela always tried to help as much as it can, but this cargo uh, plane was used for that. But it's a sovereign uh, aircraft. It belongs to Venezuela. Venezuela and it's been used for Venezuelan sovereign policies. But it has been taken from Venezuela by it, uh, the US. Well, there we have a section of news. We will be updating this with global news on sanctions and publications that might be useful in this first stage. We expect to feed more information on a daily basis, so this is always update. Well, to conclude, what is our proposal here? Well, to create collectively with the sanctioned entities, uh, academic institute, research agencies, independent researcher, that we can collectively build this tool that could help us in our global struggle against sanctions. That we have this database and we can fight misinformation, the invisibility of sanctions and come how to assist these countries to um, raise their voices against these sanctions. And uh, this could be helpful to improve anti-blockade policies. People understand better, countries understand better how this country has dealt with sanctions, how that other country has been able to fight them, etc. So yesterday we said that it is a tool for diplomacy, but it's also for cooperation and to defend multilateralism and legality because sanctions are illegal and we need to fight them from legality. And that's a debate because when a country does something to fight to fight the sanctions, they say, oh, you're doing something illegal. That happens with Venezuela and Cuba in the, uh, in the sea. We try to find maritime routes, or we try to create financing schemes outside the traditional route. Why? Because we are forced by the sanctions to find mechanism to, uh, to circumvent the sanctions, and they call it uh, uh, illegal routes. So they sanction those who do things to help us to circumvent uh, sanctions. It is something ridiculous. So. And that's uh, the case of a Venezuelan citizen who is here in the US, Alex Saab. He is an entrepreneur, but he also was um, assigned as a, a diplomat to protect him because this guy used to pl travel around the world to find food for Venezuela, to circumvent the sanctions, and he succeeded indeed to provide Venezuela with uh, food, uh, fuel, and medicine. Well, this guy was illegally detained. He was in, was in jail for more than a year and a half. And then he was sent to the U.S. and uh, for a year and a half, all his rights have been fully violated. Why? Because uh, although he has uh, a diplomatic immunity, he was detained because he infringed the blockade. And it was awful 
because the idea is to send him a cover message to an entrepreneur daring to you help Venezuela to circumvent the uh, sanction, to discipline, to terrorize, telling entrepreneurs, look what can happen to you if you dare to help any uh, uh, sanctioned country to circumvent the sanctions. So we keep struggling for the freedom of Alex Saab, and sooner or later uh, we're going to obtain his freedom because this is a just cause. Well, in closing, I have this quote of our beloved uh, uh, Chavez because Chavez accompanies us in this process because we say we are at the moment of change in the world. A shift is occurring in the world and a new world is rising and we need to hit the policy of sanctions. We need to hit the sanctioning entities and this can be done because uh, we can find new mechanisms, new systems of financial exchange and this world uh, Chavez already uh, saw, uh, and the quote that you can see here, he said this uh, that when he uh, swore uh, as president for the first time in 1999, and he was speaking to the Venezuelans, he said, a new world is coming. The world will no longer be a unipolar world, but a multipolar world. And uh, his fight was against uh, the unipolar world that was, uh, for him, uh, being morphed into a multipolar world. So he is our guide because he had the vision to see this. So I want to invite you, the People's Forum, and all of those wishing to join us in this uh, task to denounce the blockade and the sanctions so that we join forces because in this fashion we will be able to beat those sanctions and the sanctioning entities. Thank you very much. and William for this amazing presentation. Um, so uh, detailed and powerful, and I want to congratulate um, you again in the Anti-Blockade Observatory um, for all the work that you've done uh, on this geopolitical map. Um, and I think everyone here uh, will agree with me that um, this is an incredibly helpful tool in, in terms of you know, so many, uh, many people's eyes start to glaze over when they hear all the numbers and statistics, but through, as you've said, visualizing um, the extent and the impact of sanctions, um, you know, we're able to uh, understand more clearly and therefore able to organize um, in, uh, in uh, resistance to the sanctions regimes. So um, I, I also, before moving on to the next section of... Um, of the program, I just want to welcome um, all the protesters who have arrived from Grand Central <laughs> Station to the, the, the Let Cuba Live and Off the List campaign. So um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Thank you for the wonderful protest. I saw some photos from earlier um, to end the imperialist blockade on Cuba. So. Um, and now um, we'll bring, is, uh, is Rosemary here as well? I'm not sure if, if um, she's in the audience yet. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so if Rosemary and Jo Yun uh, Park can come up now. Um, and there we go. Okay, Rosemary, thank you. <laughs> I, I introduced you earlier, but I will again since um, maybe not everyone was here earlier. Um, so we are um, very uh, lucky and um, it's an honor to have um, two uh, amazing guests with us who will be commenting and responding to this amazing presentation. Um, Dr. Rosemary Mealy, member of the director, board of directors of the Interreligious Foundation for Community Organization, IFCO, Pastors for Peace, and uh, the New York Cuba Sea Coalition and author of Fidel and Malcolm X, Memories of a Meeting. And uh, we also have um, Ju Yun Park, a uh, member of Not All, and engagement editor at The Real News. So um, thank you. The, pass the mic to you both. <laughs> I'll, I'll move out of the way so that. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being with us again, and I want to express 
our highest gratitude to both the International uh, Sanctions, uh, the International Tribunal on Sanctions and Unilateral Coercive Measures, as well as to the um, the Anti Blockade Institute um, and to Carlos Ron uh, for uh, hosting us today, uh, as well as to the People's Forum, of course, um, which is always a special home for all of us. Uh, I've been asked to share a few remarks um, on behalf of Norutol, uh, explaining the value of the sanctions map to our work and to uh, anti-sanctions work in general. To provide a little bit of background, uh, Norutol is an organization of Koreans in the U.S. that are struggling against imperialism and for the national liberation and reunification of our homeland of Korea. Now, that is the tagline that we provide uh, to most people to quickly summarize uh, what we are about. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we do and how the anti-blockade map uh, supports that work. So uh, speaking very broadly of our mission, we can sort of categorize it into three parts. One is to normalize pro-DPRK and pro-reunification positions uh, within the United States. Another is to politicize and organize the Korean diaspora, but of course beyond that, uh, all the working people of the U.S. in general, and to contribute to that effort. And finally, to consolidate and advance solidarity with People's Korea among anti-imperialist and progressive forces, which we see as a project that goes hand in hand with solidarity with all nations that are targeted by imperialism. The way that we have historically achieved this is through a variety of methods. Uh, for some historical background, the organization was first founded in 1999. So next year, we are approaching 25 years of this work. Uh, one of the primary methods has historically been through delegations, particularly delegations to uh, North Korea or the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. From 2001 to 2017, there were 11 such delegations that were conducted. This work had to end in 2017 because of the imposition of a blanket travel ban against the DPRK by the Trump administration, which has been renewed every year since. So we are now entering the fifth year of that travel ban, when all U.S. passport holders are barred from entering North Korea. This includes 100,000 Korean Americans who are estimated to have direct family ties in the North. We have to remember that the Korean War occurred less than a century ago, uh, beginning in 1950, and that this is a war that has never ended. It's a war that severed a country with over 5,000 years of history, um, and in the process has separated millions of families. And this is a wound and a reality that many of our people continue to contend with to this day. Another element of the work we do is uh, popular education and producing counter-narratives against the information and the narratives deployed by the empire against our people for the purpose of prolonging the war, for the purpose of isolating uh, North Korea. And lastly, to build the organization itself, to organize and politicize members of our diaspora here in the United States to contribute to the anti-imperialist cause. How the sanction map uh, supports our work is that it helps to internationalize the struggle of the DPRK and the Korean people against imperialism. The way that imperialism so often works is that it will identify a particular country as a target. It will exceptionalize uh, problems that may exist within that country. It will construct a narrative that attempts to uh, that attempts to portray a targeted nation as some kind of aberrance that is coming out of the muck of history, that is totally disconnected from uh, the lives of people around the world, and particularly of so-called normal people here in the United States. Um, I think that what this map does is that it helps us draw the connections. It helps us understand that the same weapons and tools that are used against one country are replicated again and again against many different countries until we see what is really the construction of a world order in which some countries are kept down by force and other countries enrich themselves through the robbery of others. So I think that is the most important contribution that this map makes. And of course, it goes into a lot of very important detail. I was very impressed sitting there, uh, seeing the different kinds of categories in which the sanctions were broken up into, the ways in which it was possible to compare and contrast uh, the different kinds of sanctions levied against different nations, where those sanctions are coming from. And I think it's also very important that uh, we are not only focused on the U.S. Um, in the sanctions project, because in the particular case of the DPRK, Japan is also a very important source of these sanctions, and that's important for us to be able to identify. Um, I was asked by uh, the organizers of uh, this panel if we had any suggestions for how to improve it. 
I'm a little loath to make such suggestions. I'm not a fan of suggesting things I'm not about to do myself. Uh, but something did occur to me when we brought up Bob Menendez, which is that we have a list of the sanctions. What about the list of the sanctioners? And I think, you know, that is one thing that maybe I would point out in that, you know, it's easy to think of sanctions, of unilateral coercive measures as, oh, those are big words. They uh, seem to refer to some legal tools that are disconnected from people. But I think if we identify, no, the, pe the enemies of these countries are also the people who pass the budgets that take away money from your schools, that take away money from your social programs, that fill your streets with police. If we're able to establish those connections and actually point to these are the people who are doing that, I think that will go a long way in uh, helping the people of the U.S. to understand that we have common enemies uh, with the peoples of Venezuela, of Syria, of Iran, of the DPRK, and those enemies do not live anywhere else uh, but a few very select streets and neighborhoods in this country. Um, so with that, I would conclude my remarks and uh, repeat our gratitude to for the invitation and for the work that you've done. Thank you. Oh my God, you're so Oh, I prepared something a little longer, but I'll try to be shorter. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was, um, it was a very interesting, and, and I'm honored to have uh, listened to your presentation. And could you put, please put the uh, slide back up again? That would be really important for me. Right. Okay, so let, let me just, um, my task, um, I'm an organizer. And um, also, uh, I'm trained by the law, so my interest really is in international law. And looking at how the, um, the instrument of international law is totally violated <laughs> in the context of the discussions around sanctions and the blockade. Cuba, I'm going to be speaking primarily um, in regards to Cuba, because that's where uh, uh, most of my international work lies. And... I, I, I think that the, um, the, the, the depth of sanctions, um, you know, what, what we saw on the slide deck is very helpful in the uh, explaining the depth of sanctions. And also, I also feel and I think, and I, and I think that you would agree with me, that Cuba is a very interesting um, study in a sense. Yeah, yeah simply because it's, it's beyond sanctions. Um, it is a, it's an economic blockade, right? Now, the, the, um, the, the toolkit is, is very helpful in terms of laying out the complexities and the impacts of, of sanctions on, on, on humans, on, on the people themselves. But I just wanna um, kinda lay out something that I think is important it's important also, and, and, and that's the inclusion of, of some of the histories that um, pre predate what we know as the contemporary sanctions today, okay? And I'm speaking, I want to be more specific. In 1960, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State of the United States government, uh, Lester Mallory, and many of you have read the Mallory papers, and you know, but for those of you who have not read this little memo, it's only one page long, which really established the basis of the blockade and what we know today as the uh, extraterritorial relationships that uh, nations are forced to comply by with the fact that um, a blockade exists with Cuba. And I'm just gonna share for those of you in, in terms of time, the significance of this 1960 memorandum. How many of you know about the Mallory Memorandum? Okay, so that's good because 90% of the people here are not familiar with it. In 1960, Mallory reported, quote, that there's, there's like six points, and I'll try to summarize them. Mallory reported in 1960, in his uh, memorandum that the majority of Cubans supported, quote, Castro. The lowest estimate, he says, uh, seemed to be uh, 
He says, there is no effective political opposition. Fidel Castro and other members of the Cuban government espouse or condone communist influences. He also said in this report that communist influence is pervading the government and the body politics at an amazingly fast rate. He also wrote that militant opposition to Castro from without Cuba would only serve his and the communist uh, cause. Finally, he wrote, the only foreseeable means of alienating internal support is through disenchantment, right? And disaffection based on economic dissatisfaction and hardship. And for those of us, as this interactive map shows, crit critical is, is that hardship piece, okay? Yeah. Now, shortly after the Mallory uh, memo, we then find the introduction of, and many of you know the brief history of the, of the embargo, we find that in 1960, the US embargo of Cuba being the longest trade embargo in history, that that embargo was first imposed in 1960 under the Eisenhower administration. And, and at that time, it prohibited all the exports of all products except foods. And I won't go into really detail of what that 1960 uh, law stated. It was, called, it was the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961 that eventually uh, was put into place. And then over a year later, and this is why I think the history is important as organizers, that we, if we don't know the history of, this, of the Cuban embargo, then we, we start speaking at the point of its impact. And, and therefore, the ultimate, what do we need to do? We might lose sight on what needs to be done. All right? So I, I hear an amen back there. OK. So a little over a year later, the Treasury Department revoked the Cuban import regulations, replacing them with the more comprehensive, what we know as the Cuba asset uh, control regulations. And then, of course, the Cuban embargo continued to um, be placed in, be continued. And also, um, we now say that the embargo is really a relic of the Cold War. OK. Now, here's something that I think it's, it's important for us. I'm not an economist, um, but I try, to, um, I try to keep up to date on understanding this whole question of sanctions. I think that one of the most important things that the interactive map addresses for us initially, but could go more into detail, is the role of legislature and how legislature structures support of the blockade. It's the legislature, right? So the legal basis to enforce the policy is really whether you have legislation or not, right? So the policies are enforced by, by the law. So ultimately, the law has to be changed. The law has to be changed because the effect has to expose the extraterritorial nature and the reach of the law. And there is, you have it right there, okay? And that's, that's an important piece of the, of the document. So with, when you have a policy, and if the policy is not implemented as a law, it then provides more latitude for working around sanctions right, for working around sanctions for those third countries. For example, the policy of sanctions against Russia right now, right? We see the middleman. There's a middleman, and you mentioned that in terms of the oil in Venezuela, right? So you have this middleman that's able to cut all these deals. That's because the, the sanctions are not codified, 
right? They're not legislated, as is the, the Helms Burton and the laws that negotiate and legislate the embargo against Cuba. So in addition, increased weaponization, these are weaponized tools, right? Foreign economic policies, which include things like uh, sanctions, regulations, no access to dollars, and this is what's happening in Cuba at, at, this, at this moment. Uh, why the banks are attempting to find new ways to address the economic situation because there's no dollars, so therefore the banking system is causing havoc on the people. Again, because unless you have, uh, even, even now putting together a tajeta, a new banking card, everybody has to have a new banking card now, right? How can a, f <laughs> that, and that, that creates all kinds of issues, farmers with banking cards, you know. But again, it goes right back to the impact of this blockade. So the law is able to have the, uh, another kind of impact in terms of the policy because law supports sanctions, as I said. It's the law that supports the sanctions against Cuba, but not the same way as it would in the example of Russia because there's no legal basis. There's no legal basis for, for penalization, you see. And that's why um, India is able to sell oil, uh, use Russian oil, right? Because there's no legal basis for penalizing uh, another nation state, all right? So I think that those would be as an organizer and someone working around the issue and utilizing this interactive map. There are aspects of it that we can use, but I think the historical piece, the uniqueness of the embargo against Cuba does require that we have a little more information. And finally, how do you, how do you lift, how do you change the law, okay? It requires money because you need lobbyists, right? If we had, if we had, <laughs> and, and some people might call, say I'm, I'm bordering on heresy here. But if we had lobbyists strutting through the halls of Congress, lobbying the legislators around lifting the embargo against Cuba and not the incremental things that the president is able to do, can you imagine how we would be able to impact changing the law, right? So every, every, every law that's, that's changed, you have to go back to the halls of, of Congress, but it requires big bucks for to, to, to pay lobbyists. I leave you with that, heresy or not. Um, we were just going. We were going to do a Q and A, um, but uh, William and Carlos, do you want to directly respond to Juhun and um, and Rosemary? Yeah. Sí. Bueno, muchas gracias. Eh, pero fíjense, hay, hay varias cosas. Esto es una propuesta Aspects. inicial This is just que explora an initial proposal un that is exploring this issue that has not been explored before. The UN rapporteur says that every country faces this problem with its very own tools. And since there is not international consensus except to reject the legality of sanctions, but since they are specific measures of each country against other countries which have history, they have their own characteristics, so the problem remains invisible. I think there, are, there were two very important remarks here on how to incorporate other elements that are not included right now. For example, the legislator. You mentioned that Cuba is uh, like a model 
in the regard that at a time where the theory of sanctions was not developed, they started an aggressive escalation of every kind. And they used legal and not non-legal instruments or illegal instruments, attacks, conspiracies, military aggressions, and laws. And those laws also included executive orders, specific measures. So it is very complex when we look at every country and the way that this aggression has been organized. It cannot only be reduced to a sanction to one person or one organization. In the case of Cuba, and also learned from the example of DPRK, they have been imposed sanctions from Japan, and this is related to a specific history. So I believe there is an opportunity for us to build collectively a narrative that goes well beyond the issue of UCMs. Is uh, the narrative uh, of uh, the imperial aggressions based upon the economic matters, but beyond these, uh, the juridical, the diplomatic matters against many countries? We need to build this collectively to open the doors to recognizing all of these phenomena and to integrate them as a part of our denounce. Because there are many things that are already very clear in the world, but nothing happens. Cuba has been trying to pass a resolution for 30 years. It was voted by 89% of the members of the UN, but nothing happened because these measures are unilateral. They are measures applied by the US. These measures are not discussed by the Security Council or any other agency of the UN. They are separate from this. So there is a vote which politically and symbolically is important, but it does not have any effects. So if we try to incorporate, or if we do incorporate all of these phenomena, if we enlarge the scope and the methodology, we are going to have valuable tools to face this issue collectively. This needs to be a struggle of all of us and we, where we try to eradicate the injustices against these people. For example, the DPRK has suffered for many years, for example, the access of food. There is a whole campaign to destroy any capacity that they have to avoid food reaching the people of the country, and the people, of course, suffer. And the same thing happened with Cuba. There are some differences because Cuba has not been sanctioned by the Union, European Union and somehow they have been able to acquire some things in other ways. But Venezuela has been applied sanctions by, by the US, by the European Union, even though they are different. The European Union sanctions in paper are not very serious. But the results, their indirect effect due to the overcompliance is a very hard because many European companies refuse to work with Venezuela due to the fear. And this happens also with Cuba and with Iraq. So this attack is uh, happening through many different channels. And this map is a tool that is open to be fed with many other elements. And we already can see how we can expand this map to make it a more powerful tool to defend the rights of our peoples. Just really uh, quickly, I, I, I think you had a very important point, and it's that the need that we don't lose sight of, of that this is a strategy um, that often we could get lost into in, in the language and even doubt uh, when they say, well, these people are sanctioned because they're uh, drug traffickers or human rights or whatever excuse. But when you look back at the history of how these uh, projects come up, uh, you realize that there's, there's political intent from the beginning. You know, one, one, one uh, bit of information that, uh, that William shared 
which um, which I think is really important and kind of shows this. The FinCEN uh, warning about the the Venezuelan, uh, uh, you know, the, the, w it basically said that uh, the transactions, the Venezuelan transactions, should be put on on, on hold, and, and they're suspicious, whatever. Um, it's, they, there was a line in that in that text uh, that it said, if you see any Venezuelan public institution making purchases or having some exchange on something that was not its nature, uh, then that should you know set the alarms or some. I'm paraphrasing more here, but and this is important because there was a point that at that point in time. We had taken a decision uh, as as a government to uh, use uh, you know the money the, the income coming to the state uh, oil company PDVSA to engage in social programs such as and you know everything from building homes to uh, supplying food and medicine everything. So basically, if the oil company is purchasing. I don't know, chicken, because it's part of, it's part of you know a, a, a food program, a subsidized food program, that was that was supposed to come into you know under suspicion. That was going to set off the alarms. Basically, what these things are doing is not only that they're trying to you know uh, punish, but they don't they're they're trying to do everything so that a socialist government, a government that has social conscience, that has social programs in place, it, that that it, it can't do it. You know, they're trying to block any opportunity for us for a government to do that. Then they'll come out and say, "Well, you see, you know, the problems the country has is because of socialism." It's it's an attempt against a program. It's an attempt against an uh, an ideology. So I think you know it's important that we don't lose sight uh, of, of all that that is uh, implied within uh, this uh, model. And going back, and I don't want to mention Menendez one more time, but you know, given that. We have to today because it's, you know, I'm sorry. I'm, this is uh, this is fun. I have it's poetic justice, uh, but you know the fact that. Um, but but again, coming back to what you were saying, Menendez was uh, is actually uh, he has a draft of a uh, update of the Verdad Act, which is this, uh, which is basically what he's trying to do there is do uh, what the Helmsburg Act does. You know. The, codify the the sanctions executive orders and everything into legislation that later you know it's going to be much much harder to uh take out and and, and we see it's not just going to be an executive order that can overturn this uh so this is the intent that these people have i i agree with with it's, it's a good idea to point the finger sometimes at at people who are who must you know in a way that the, it's it's for their own political gain and and other types of gain that they are they're doing these uh, they're pushing these agendas and and it's important to be uh to be aware that what these legislations entail is you know precisely just making uh these sanctions regime you know harsher to the people that it affects I also think it's selective. It's like selective prosecution, um, because yesterday uh, the United States government signed an agreement with Vietnam, and it stated, "We recognize and and respect your socialist government." Okay, and then today in Congress there's a hearing that uh, China is too close to the United States in terms of whatever, and that we must fight communism. So, you know, it's double talk. And, and I think that, you know, we have to also point out those contradictions as well, you know, and I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Um, I, I'm just going to add really quickly to this discussion. I, I just wanted to also point out that um, as part of our international tribunal, um, we also did hearings on Puerto Rico, Haiti, um, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the Hawaiian Kingdom, which don't directly have sanctions or like 
official blockades imposed on them, but they have um, they are colonized by the United States um, in what is essentially like economic colonialism, and and so we we thought that that was relevant um, to our analysis, right? Um, and I think um, what, what you had mentioned, um, Jo Hyun, about uh, Nodatal's um, popular education, right? And because uh, I, this is a very interesting conversation about this very specific task of uh, making policymakers, decision makers understand that this is a broken policy and this is a policy that actually is harmful, right? And make them see that policy like chemical weapons, right? As something that we can't continue for humanity. Um, but I think, you know, we, we still have the task of building the political will uh, to put pressure on the decision makers and um, and I think popular education is really important for that and there's actually a student in the room Lauren who um, is part of her internship is trying for example to create a toolkit for college students to learn about the sanctions and to uh, potentially organize campaigns on their campuses as well so I think that there's like many many layers to this um, Anyway, I can go on forever, but I'm going to start with Q&A, and I already saw one hand up. Um, I'll start with Sarah. Did you have okay, sure. Sarah, and then Medea, um, and then in the back, okay. Well, I first wanted to thank you for a tremendous, really a resource, uh, a tremendous tool uh, I'm speaking to you from the Sanctions Kill campaign here in the U.S., which is a, a campaign to really draw attention to this policy. And we were first inspired, it was initiated from a talk given uh, in Venezuela, uh, no, at an, at an international forum. But it referred to 40 sanctioned countries. And so our first research project was to identify, and it wasn't easy, uh, these 40 countries, and to make that the basis of webinars, petitions, campaigns. And, and we did list all of them um, in our book that we've put out. Uh, and, and we were trying also for an interactive map, you're way ahead of us, that's fabulous, that's fabulous. But um, I am wondering why it's now down to 30, because really we did find 40 uh, countries that have very onerous sanctions on them, and there are new ones all the time, just in the last few months, uh, both Niger and Cambodia, new, new sanctions. Uh, so, so it's just a question of why 30, because I, I do think you're the number that you came up with, 40, we spent a lot of time actually identifying all those countries. And the other question is about um, United Nations sanctions, which all came at the pressure and demand of the United States and are held in place by the United States. And it's particularly true for Korea, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Iraq, Iran, Libya, Lebanon. I, I, there's 15 countries that are under United Nations sanctions, each of them demanded by the US, half of them really desperately poor African countries. So uh, if that will be part of uh, your work, uh, because, because really ending the UN sanctions uh, I think is an important part. It's, it's no longer, the Security Council will no longer vote these things because it's a new day. But uh, ending them, I think, is, is very important because they're some of the most onerous, uh, as we saw with the earthquake in Syria and the floods in Libya, a direct response of, of the US sanctions. Thank you. And thanks for this project. I'm just going to take all the questions. Well, yes, thank you so much for this wonderful tool. I look forward, and I'm sure we all do, of, of really looking into it. Um, Rosemary, you talked about a, a, uh, an army of lobbyists we don't have, but we do have people power. 
and um, some organizations have called on October 26 to come to Washington and protest sanctions, and uh, we'll be setting up meetings for folks who can come, so maybe we can work with the People's Forum and trying to send that notice to people who've come here tonight to try to get them to come and do it on a regular basis, like every month. And the other is, uh, a kind of, you know, what could we do with, like civil disobedience against sanctions? Um, we once had a project in Cuba where everybody gave $10 and openly said, we're investing in a Cuban company that produces milk for lactose intolerance kids. And then we sent the list of all the names of the people, thousands of people who invested to OFAC and said, we just want you to know, you know. And we never got any response from them, which is good, you know. And then... Uh, uh, when when Obama came in, you know that was that was a, a, a positive change, but we haven't done it since. Uh, and in the case of North Korea, we did it with a, a windmill factory. Um, so, uh, and I wonder around Korea, uh, can you go to Canada, and could a big group go to Canada and go to North Korea? Um, through Canada, and are there other things we could invest in collectively that would just be, you know, a form of civil disobedience? Thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm Gloria Lariva from the Cuba and Venezuela Solidarity Committee. Um, the same way that Bill Clinton uh, gave up the presidential prerogative, which he used, presidents used to have, to be able to lift the blockade with a simple signature by putting that, uh, take, giving it to the hands of Congress in the Helms-Burton law. People do not know that, one of the onerous parts of it. The same way I think that uh, Maria Elvira Salazar, that right wing Cuban, um, used to be Cuban congressperson from Florida, is trying to um, codify the SSOT against Cuba which is very, very dangerous. People used to say, no, Helms Burton won't pass, but it did. The US used a pretext. So I wonder, Rose Mallory, and by the way, I think a lot of people would be willing to lobby, and we should, we've all done it at some point, but we're trapped in the US politics where both parties are afraid of being attacked for supporting Cuba, doing something positive, and we're in the middle of you know, getting on to 2024. So we'll see where that goes, but the, I have a question about, do you know the status of that proposal before Congress, what's happening with it? And thank you all for your presentations. Um, I just have one last question, and then you all can answer. Oh, I'm, I'm last. <laughs> uh, good evening. I'm Margaret Kimberly from Black Agenda Report and Black Alliance for Peace, and uh, I joined the fact-finding mission to Venezuela, um, there has to be a way for people to understand what this word sanctions means for other human beings. I think a lot of people think it just means I can't take money to Cuba or I can't send money to this country or that country. They don't know that it means people don't get food, that uh, the children's cardiology hospital we visited cannot buy medical equipment. They don't have the equipment they should have in order to perform surgery. Um, I think in, in addition to the uh, uh, outreach, the lobbying efforts, there we have got to find ways for people to know what the word sanctions really means. I think if p most people knew what it really meant, what it really does to human beings all over the world, I think it's something that would be opposed. But I also want to add very quickly, they know that Joe Biden lied. He was asked in two, when he was running in 2020 about lifting sanctions on Cuba or uh, changing Trump policy, and he lied. He knows what people want. So I just wanted to raise up those, uh, those points. Thank you. Bueno, un comentario muy breve, eh, porque me siento realmente muy, muy feliz de estar aquí, 
porque nosotros vinimos a presentar el mapa geopolítico de las sanciones y lo geopolítico que... map of uh, uh, sanctions and now we take with us a number of tasks information and things that we need to develop uh, together you are right the map does not include at this stage the UN sanctions and it's uh, it was done on purpose at this stage we have not included it but the fact that the UN imposed uh, sanctions uh, have resulted in many of the tragedies that we are uh, witnessing in Libya Syria Iraq and so on so that's a module that we need to develop in order to include uh, the UN sanctions. You are right. And this is a struggle that we need to wage both within and without the UN. The UN says that if there is an agreement within the Security Council, those uh, sanctions are legal. But uh, we need to wonder who are the members of the Security Council. The Council is not the the General, uh, General Assembly, it is the Security Council. But who are the members of the Security Council? So we need to, t to work together in order to insert the information you are mentioning. It is a technical issue, but here we used very limited sources for this initial stage, uh, basically OFAC, and not all of them are from OFAC. In the case of the US, there are four main sanctioning uh, agencies. Of OFAC is the first, but then we have the Department of Commerce, of Transportation, and Department of State. And any other department that, that based on executive order or prior uh, norm, uh, 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 task them with uh, applying uh, sanctions. In the case of China, there are little, little sanctions. But most of the sanctions against uh, China come from other departments, not OFAC. So we need to enlarge the methodology to be able to encompass all type of sanctions and all type of agencies approving those sanctions, and also to assess the impacts. What proposals can uh, uh, issue, can be obtained from this approach? Well, this could go beyond the multilateral agencies. All of this is challenging the efficacy of uh, the UN to deal with sanctions because these remain unilateral decisions decided by sovereign states based on their political might. But then you are right. We still have work to do. And Medea, you are right. Remember the struggle of the collective uh, movement in the US to defend the diplomatic integrity of our uh, diplomatic seat in uh, Washington. That's a struggle against sanctions. That is part and parcel of the actions that we need to carry out. So without this tool, in this country, Brazil, uh, collectives have uh, mobilized against those uh, measures included in the sanctions. So it is clear that we need to join the study, the theoretical uh, approach, and uh, the actions, concrete actions, because it is through those that we could uh, achieve someday uh, changes in these policies. I, I I mean the last I know know was the campaign that Asir had had started. Um, I know it was um, it's marked up. I don't know the status of it at this point. But if there's anybody from Asir, uh, maybe you, uh, Margaret, you may know. No, okay, yes. Uh, well, we've been told by the State Department it's not going to come to a vote, but I wouldn't trust the State. Okay. Department. 
maybe it was those um, letters and campaigns that we that we launched. Maybe it had an impact. The people's power. Oh yeah, I just wanted to quickly answer. Um, regarding travel to North Korea, so the specific ban is against U.S. passport holders traveling. It's not a ban on flights from the U.S. to North Korea. So I don't believe there's a direct route from Canada to North Korea. Any route that you would take would have to go through China. Um, so logistically speaking, uh, once you arrive at the border, I highly doubt that they would stamp a U.S. passport, but I think when we're thinking about the political value of travel, uh, we would have to consider the fact that it is the actual act of a U.S. passport holder traveling, which is criminalized, um, and that you know there would be consequences uh, that would come from that. So that would be just an initial response. Um, and as a final note, um, I would also like to speak up for the inclusion of uh, U.N. sanctions. I know that they are technically multilateral, but I think we know the U.N. Security Council is not really a multilateral body. Um, and I think getting to Margaret's very important comment, um, a lot of the harshest sanctions against the DPRK are shored up by the UN. It's the UN that also designates that metal items of any kind cannot be imported into North Korea, that designates that all of its major export industries from coal to agriculture to fisheries are banned overseas, that has issued a call in, I believe, 2017 at first, uh, for all nations that had DPRK foreign workers to revoke their work visas and deport those people back to the DPRK. Um, so the UN uh, multilateral sanctions, uh, multilateral, are really um, another very coercive layer on top of this. And I think, you know, uh, going with the theme of not getting lost in the legalese and what's unilateral, what's multilateral, let's just look at these for what they are, which is an effort to really instate a global system of apartheid, right? A global system where certain countries have to accept their lot at the bottom of the economic totem pole. And any country that deviates from that will be struck down with all uh, manner of violence um, in order to prevent them from succeeding and to make an example of them to other countries. So that would be the argument that I would make in favor of that. Okay. Quisiera agregar una, una idea. And uh, I'd like to add an idea regarding these travel bans. There, you can see a manipulation. Because when you, there is a ban to travel to a country, well, a country can ban the citizens to travel, but it means that those who are going to invest or going to do business, you cut the economic flow between countries, but it is disguised on these uh, travel alerts. This is used in the Caribbean when they're trying to put uh, pressure on them. When there is a travel alert, well, you are threatening those countries because be they l tourism is essential to those countries. So it is a disguised uh, pressure on these uh, countries. It has an impact on the life of those countries. In the case of Venezuela, mm, there are a number of restrictions, not only travel bans, but also restrictions for the uh, airlines, US airlines, certified pilots or certified aircrafts. And up until the uh, year, there was uh, a prohibition to fly be, be beneath uh, 2,000 feet. It's like a uh, exclusion zone, commercial exclusion zone, because uh, in that uh, height, uh, most of aircraft should fly. So uh, the aircraft should uh, uh, skip Venezuelan airspace. So you, you, you dictate uh, these exclusion zones when you're going to uh, in, in, invade that country. So you see that type of uh, very specific measures that look as administrative measures. In the end, these are very harmful policies for the economy of those countries. Well, yesterday I was uh, seeing the problem with the Venezuelan migration here in uh, New York, uh, where there have been requests by Venezuelan migrants to go back to Venezuela. Uh, however, the U.S. prevents the 
Venezuelan airline to come to Venezuela to pick up Venezuelan migrants who want to go back to Venezuela because these uh, people have no longer any resources to stay here. So that's a restriction. Venezuela cannot repatriate some of uh, its uh, migrants because in Peru, in Chile, there have been this obstacle. But then they organized this international case because of the Venezuelan migrants. Venezuela has the most important program of uh, repatriation of their own migrants. And uh, Venezuela does it with its own resources. And the purpose is to try to repatriate its migrants. But uh, the United States, the United States does not allow this to happen uh, because our uh, official uh, aircraft cannot c come here. We do not deny that there was a migration of Venezuelans to other countries in the region. However, we have there is a lot of hypocrisy regarding this and the manipulation in order to use migrants as part of the negative narrative against Venezuela. So these uh, uh, travel bans uh, also have uh, a, a, a ominous effect on the economies, the right to free movement, uh, etc. I just want to use this moment to thank everybody again for your solidarity, for your uh, commitment to, to uh, uh, denouncing these aggressions against Venezuela, against Cuba, against all these countries uh, that, are, that are suffering uh, uh, under these uh, um, measures, these uh, sanctions. And you know, and also because of your commitment to raising awareness, because again, you know, it's it's, it's like you were saying before, the you know, the, the the definition of the word that doesn't that we don't lose track of of what it really means and what it really implies. And you know, again, uh, of course, we love to always see you in Venezuela. Uh, I know that coming to to Venezuela or experiences first firsthand in Venezuela, Cuba, and, and the other countries are under these attacks experiencing what they do but also experiencing how people react and how people survive and how people fight it off and how people can even prosper uh because nobody you know takes this down we you know in, in venezuela we're fighting i know cuba's fighting and many countries are fighting this um it's important that you are there also to witness it and to be in a way you know uh the voice of what you know all those people can come here and say but it's your testimony that can really help change the situation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you again, uh, Carlos and William, Rosemary and Tuhyun. That was really um, very informative and very powerful panel. I wanted um, to let everyone know that um, a week from today, uh, the International People's Tribunal on U.S. Imperialism, which has held 16 hearings on the use of economic coercive measures, is going to be closing out its tribunal um, at the People's Forum uh, on Friday night with a political panel, uh, which Carlos actually will be joining, um, and then on Saturday uh, with a panel of our jurors from around the world who are going to talk about the findings of those hearings and also what's next for, for that campaign. Um, so look on, you can look on the People's Forum site um, to find out more information about that. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>